an alcoholic helped me. His name was Bart. Bart was uh, uh, among a uh, number of the alcoholics that frequented our block where the church was located. And Bart would, every Sunday morning, he'd bring in, he and his 12, very interesting, 12 alcoholics would come in for the nine o'clock celebration. He and his 12? He and his 12. It's very interesting. <laughs> and they would come in and they would sit there and the celebration would go on and every once in a while Bart would say, can I speak? Can I speak? Again, you know, this is the breakthrough that we constantly had. I want to speak, Cecil. It's time. I, I'm going to say something or whatever, you know. And uh, one Sunday I said to him, okay, you've asked to speak. Now you take over. You preach this morning. And he stood there and he said, have I done this before? <laughs> I said, you better know it. <laughs> yes, you have. I said, there have been short and spurts of spoken words, but I'm giving you now 20 minutes. <laughs> Man, he stood there and he kept shaking his head. He kept shaking his head. And he said to me then, why'd you take down the cross? <laughs> I said, because I wanted you to know that the cross has come to you. Your suffering, whatever happens to you, is our concern. We are there in the midst of you and everybody else. So the separation, the separation no longer exists. The separation right. between right. someone who gives and someone who receives, it's the same person. That's right. The separation between someone of one faith and the other faith is right. there's no separation. That's right. It gets down to fundamentals. Yeah. And that's how Glide became so forceful also, is that there were different groups that would come in saying, help us. You know, if it were not some of the people of, who were atheists would come in and say, why do you do what you do? Uh, we're, we're with you, but we're not with, with what, uh, and, and I just say, uh, okay, okay, <laughs> you, you're with us, we're with you, okay, okay, I don't want to take anything away from you. So people are coming in and say, they're, they're declaring, this is what we're for, this is what we're against, yeah, right. and, exactly. and, and, and wanting to engage on the against side, and you say, um, yeah. well, no, that's... No big thing. That's okay. Yeah. And, I, and then I had folks who said to me also, uh, some of the few church members that would say to me, why do you only say Jesus on, uh, uh, on Sundays about two or three times and that's it? Can't you, can't you really preach Jesus? And, and I'd say, uh, I don't understand why you want me to preach Jesus. I'm living Jesus. I'm living Buddha. I'm living you know, you, you want me to recite something so it will sound like I am really committed. It's not what I recite, it's what I do. It's in the doing. And, and I think a number of people begin to realize that. that the hippies came in and, 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 and they immediately, after being with us for a little while, we, we, we really went to some very critical risk with them. And, and, and they said, we can't believe this. And, and they came back on, on a Sunday morning, a uh, Sunday afternoon, and they took off their, their, their necklaces and they took off their rings and they took off things that they had and brought them and put them on the altar. There was not an altar there because I had taken it up by then, but where the altar was. Mm -hmm. And they put it there and they said, we bring to you a symbol of what you have meant to us, what this church has meant to us. You have never forgotten us. You always stood with us in the most difficult situations. And we did. We just did. So it's not about the ritual. It's yeah. not about the, the form. It's not about the trappings. You got it. It's about the living. You got it. That's the bottom line. That's it. Very much so. Do you think that that's why over the years so many people have come to Glide? I, I remember sitting in one of these uh, celebrations and you were talking and there were people in the, in the congregation who I recognized 
and they were people from so many different denominations. There were people who got up and they were from this or that foundation, this or that group, uh, people who um, are focused on different religions or different, different religious affiliations, no religious affiliation, people who uh, are, are focused on different ethnicities and so on, all there to yeah. support Glide. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the world comes to Glide, meaning that it, it, this past Sunday, there were at least six different countries that were represented there. Uh, the other thing that helps us is we draw people in because we have s so many programs, but we draw people in especially when it comes to the food program, yeah. the feeding of the people, the gathering of the tribes to eat, to share. And so people come there as volunteers. We had 20,000 volunteers last year. Uh, who came and worked, and they come up, a, a lot of them, to, of course, the celebrations on Sunday, and, and they get caught up in that, and, and they come back again, some of them, and some of them come back again and say, look, we are from, uh, you know, uh, from New York, but uh, we'd like to be a part of Glide. What do we do? And or Australia or yeah, Germany. Uh, exactly. Amy, Amy Arrett, the board chair, That's right. That's right. told me the story about some tourists who were wandering around. <laughs> yeah. They were looking for this place, and she That's said, right. you won't believe this, but guided them into Glide. And when she told me the story, she said that she turned around, and the person had tears in, in yeah. their eyes and uh, ended up um, deciding to, that day, on the spot, uh, make a substantial contribution to the work of Glide. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Not not asked, just just sat there and just said that's this right. is intensely meaningful. Well, they were looking for a church that they said they had been advertised from. They were from Australia, that had been advertised of uh, having a uh, concert that uh, that Sunday afternoon, and they were they said we're trying to find that church that's going to have a concert. And she said, well, that's my church. I'm the chair of the board. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, they, uh, they said, oh, my God, really? And so she directed them, brought them, in fact, to the, that afternoon's uh, uh, concert. And they just sat there and weeped and clapped and felt so good and so committed and said, you know, we'll be seeing you. You'll hear from us. And we've heard from them, of course. It's, uh, it's amazing. I, I can just tell you at this mark time after time of how people have come and, and found something that would speak to them. And this, this, Glad, this is why it's good for Glad not to have uh, something that just says, everybody has to be this way. If you're not this way, then forget it, you know. Um, we have people who have said to us, uh, we were going to Golden Gate Bridge to jump off, and we came by Glide, and the celebrations lifted us up, and we couldn't go to the bridge. Uh, that kind of thing takes place. We've had people to say, you know, I, I really was very put out with, uh, with my family, and I wasn't sure what I would do but now that I've been to Glide, I, I know that I've got to do something that will not harm them or do any of body in. What I must do is, as we would say, celebrate life. Uh, and it's that kind of, I think, um, it's that kind of interaction, that kind of human dynamic that just sometimes I well, like last Sunday, for instance, a very moving uh, glide that uh, Janet brought in four or five people in, to deal with uh, domestic violence. And one young man stood up and his poetry was about the fact that he had been one of the perpetrators. He had been one of the, the persons who had beaten uh, his his friend, his lady, his 
person. And, and he began to cry as he was reading his, uh, as he was reciting his poetry. And the people just all over the place were just breaking down, you know, weeping and mourning. That's the kind of thing that's so critical because people, people need to feel like you care and that you understand also. You understand what they're going through. Don't ever miss the opportunity to create a kind of climate that, that uh, empowers people, that helps people to confront what they're going through so they can go through it themselves rather than have the dependency aspect where you have to always lift people up and keep them at a relationship which many times uh, if we'd only work to include what they are and who they are, it would be much better. So you finesse the issue of codependence that okay. is hovering out there as a criticism of, of any type of service. Yeah. In a sense, you finesse it by taking down the cross and, right. and eliminating that separation. It's not that we are codependent or perhaps we are entirely codependent on each other. We right. are one. We right. are right. Right. one people. Exactly. And the assumption of responsibility is about giving somebody that respect, giving yeah. somebody that ear, giving yeah. somebody that time. A lot of people uh, in the business of getting, not giving. But I'm in the business, and I'm in the, I'm in the world to engage in giving rather than getting. Um, sometimes the getting gets us into a kind of way by which we become selfish, we become uh, so caught up in uh, our little, uh, little way of getting whatever we want and need and pushing other people back. One of the things that concerns me is I keep thinking about people who invest and I keep thinking about people also who, who, really, who really would like to find themselves. They say to me, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And I say to them, well, what's happened? You're looking and nothing has happened. Now, when is it going to happen? Sometimes I can't wait because I want it to happen, you know. And then when I think about it, I say to myself, all right, Cecil, let them go at their pace. But there's another thing that says to me, I have several voices, by the way, to speak to <laughs> There's another thing that says to me, look. Shake them up, shake them up. That dynamic often comes when you want things to happen. You keep saying, when is it gonna happen? And they say, wait, 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 wait. And I keep thinking, God, how long? How long? There's a song that's sung, how long? How long? And I keep saying, now, now. Now, <laughs> and and this the, this this need to get, well, the way I understand what you're saying is that need exists within all of us. Yeah, rich sure. or poor. That's right. Wealthy or not, if you sit there on the on the street, or in the building that you own on that street, and if you're thinking only about getting, you're in the same place. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We have just oh, we will be completing. Um, our second housing complex um, in the very near future. We have built two homes, two places for the homeless. And we finished one uh, about uh, six months ago and it is beautiful. And, and the people it, it, it are just so thrilled about the fact that we have finished a, a place, a 14-story building for, for, for uh, families, 
and, and we had no trouble filling it up. In fact, we had a line, still about 2,000 people who were waiting to try to get in. Now we have one that's, that will be, be finished in a few months, and it's for single people who are poor. And I never thought that I would have something to do with building buildings for people and with people. Uh, and it's lovely. We were by there the other day and stopped and talked to some of the con construction people and, and uh, there's a line waiting to get. It's an eight-story housing complex for the poor. We already have one that we've had for 10 years now. Yes. And it's worked very well. We were told that uh, uh, oh, you, you building these buildings for poor people, you won't, they'll tear them up in six months. Well, that's not true. That first one we built 10 years ago is marvelous. It's just, they've done a great job because it's theirs. They own it. And when you have that going for you, they're not going to destroy anything. What they want to do is build up more. They want, they want to say, this is mine, and I'm going to take care of it. That's what they want. Well, anyway, I never thought. Here I am, you know, coming from San Angelo, Texas, not even thinking in terms of what can happen, but just saying, I want to make things happen that will give life to people rather than take away from people. I want to give, and it's happened. So you take the risk of going into places that you had never even conceived of going? Never, 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 no, no, no. Coming from San Angelo, Texas? <laughs> I tell you, Mark, it's been a good ride, and it is, too. I, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have Janice, though, I'm telling you. She's, uh, she has, uh, helped me to look beyond uh, so many things that I probably would not have been able to do if I had not had someone like Janice Mirkatani, my wife. She's, uh, she's a very smart woman, very smart. And she, um, she's very strong, pers very persistent. When she wants something to go, you better get out of the way. Yes, I, I, I have myself experienced this. <laughs> you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is, is that there is so much heart, but you're also, you personally, Jan, certainly, the organization, it's a hard-headed organization. It is a very practical organization. It is focusing on, it focuses on impact. Yeah. Um, how does that balance work where there is the, the idea and the reality put into practical terms of unconditional love. And then you are out there and you are, you are if, if you took away the nonprofit aspect and the fact that you're in the business of giving instead of the business of getting, it's a business. Sure. It's a sure. business of giving. That's right. That's right. And it has operations, it has funding, it has, it has revenue streams, it has, it has um, uh, infrastructure, it has capital projects. Those projects need to be managed. You have mm -hmm. everything from IT competencies, information technology competencies, to program competencies, to uh, social work competencies. It's, it is a, a substantial operation. That's right, it sure is. How do you strike that balance? I don't know. <laughs> 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 it has not been easy. <laughs> I, I think the important thing is to begin to get out of the way. Begin to get out of the way. Yeah, let people who are competent in areas of their expertise, who let them help handle the situation, and don't, 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 don't get jealous or envious of people who may be creating also from their perspective. Uh, take care of the people that are there, the people who work every day, the people who give every day. Make sure you take care of them. Make sure that they know that you care about what they're doing and what you're trying to 
promote. And make sure you're clear, that's the second thing. Make sure you're clear about what you're doing and how you're doing it. You know, people talk about being a visionary. Well, I do a lot of vision stuff because I use a lot of what is called my imagination. I, I imagine things. And when I'm imagining things, I'm very good at coming up with things that uh, go beyond my comprehension. Uh, but I go beyond it and, and find ways by which uh, excite me and excite others. And, and you have to, but you have to know how far to go. You have to know this is all you need to go. There are others who can go also. Let them do it. Do you envision a result, or do you envision an impact? Do you, do you respond to a need? When you, when you say that you imagine the future, is that something that's, that's concrete? Do you imagine, for example, 80 units? Or, or, do you, or do you imagine a future where there is not endemic homelessness in the area? Yeah. It, the important thing, I think, is to imagine how in the world can we make the world a better world in which to live? How? Is there any way? Is there any way by which you can call the world to task and say, essentially, how do we make it work? How do we make how do we assure ourselves that, um, that there will not be poverty? And then when I begin to imagine how I would do it, I begin then to see that maybe the way we do it is that we, we look at ourselves as those who at least have the power, but we may not have the will. We have the power to drastically make this world uh, become one which all people can at least find some equitable participation, some, e some equality, some, some fullness with each other. But saying that is also probably trying to make sure that there, that there are those who are willing and ready to do it. And there are those who are willing and ready to do it. How do you get the people to move? It seems to me is the basic question. I don't know, except that I imagine that it would be really exciting if in every country we would come together at the same time and say poverty is over and here is what we have. Is it that simple? Is it, is it as simple as us saying it's today simple. positive po poverty is over? It's over. It's simple, but it's very difficult in practical terms to do because you can't get everybody to do it because there will be those who will say, uh-uh, I'm a getter, not a giver. So the center is us, the answer is us, the community right. is us. Always. And it goes back to that, removing that separation between us and them, or between ourselves and the sufferer. Yes. Yeah. It is an amazing, amazing journey that you've brought this organization, this community on. I have one last question. I, I, I have no idea um, how you will respond to this. And it, it really revolves around Race has had such a huge impact on this nation from its inception. How do you see race playing into America's future 
uh, going forward. First and foremost, I am an African American. I am a strong African American. I have great confidence and courage in being an African American. I uh, feel that I will measure up no matter where I go to a situation that I will take on as I did Glide and that I will take it on from the perspective of being an African American. I am nothing else but an African American. I played the white game at one, year, one time, years ago. I was the Oreo cookie, you know? And I thought that I could do something then by being the Oreo cookie, that if I would just be a little white with being a little black, that it would work. It won't work. <laughs> but what it did to me is I have what is called self-definition. And self-definition says to me, there is nothing in the world that I cannot pull off when it comes to race. You are who you are. I am who I am, yes. And I can really pull off. I would imagine that there are a number of places I could go and have been. I'm called on to do a lot of stuff, you know, related to race, one way or the other. And I have confidence and, and courage to face it, whatever it is. But what I try to do with folks is get people to understand that if you don't take care of you, if you can't affirm yourself, you can't affirm others. You, you cannot, you know, if you, can't, if you can't stand up and say, this is who I am and I really love who I am and I stand up for who I am. And therefore, I don't have to do anybody else in. I don't have to do you in, because I'm trying to I, not do myself in, but I keep doing myself in, in spite of the fact that I keep doing things that go against me. So you're not living in opposition to somebody else. You're living as an affirmation of yourself. That's right, that's right. And that may be most frightening to a lot of folks but on the other hand, it sounds good to a lot of other folks. And I've tried a lot of things, but I want to say this. I make no excuses. I've been in most of the major mar uh, marches. I've taken plane, uh, airline, airplane uh, trips to the south with the plane full of folks from the Bay Area who went with me to demonstrate. We've done a lot of demonstrating in the South. Uh, I, when I left Kansas City, I left Kansas City heated because uh, we had done, I worked with Congress of Racial Equality at that particular time, and we had just stirred up Kansas City, Missouri. I was a part of that. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give up on race, no, no, because I think that, that there are things that we're doing and there are things that we can do that we have not done, but we need to do them. And I think that uh, as long as I have a breath in my body, I'm going to do what I can to make sure that race does not cut people down, but that it opens people up to live quite differently, to live fully, to, uh, to stand up, to make sure that race does not lose, that race wins ultimately, and that we can do it, we can do it, we can do it. You just have to take risk. You, you have to say, I'm going all the way, and that's what I'm doing. I'm going all the way with race, because I know that people can change, and I'm talking about all kinds of people. And we will celebrate our differences rather than be divided very, by oh, our very differences. Much so. Very much so. Yes. Cecil Williams, thank you so much.
Reverend Cecil Williams. Yeah. You are my hero. Thank you. Thank you. It's good being with you.